people remember yesterday we introduced uh, the notion of uh, normal cone so if we have uh, a closed embedding of schemes and we call i the ideal shape of x in m then we define tx in m to be the spec of the direct sum of i to the n modulo i to the n plus 1 and uh, we view this as an affine scheme over x uh, so why we and uh, this is called uh, the normal cone of x in m so since cones play a big role in uh, intersection theory i now want to make a little detour and try to talk about cones in general and uh, um, why we need this language also in some sense try to motivate that it is really a natural language so let me make a parenthesis let me start with uh, a condition everybody who has uh, studied Hartshorn is familiar with this is a condition which is introduced uh, in the chapter about projective morphism it's called condition dagger which is that uh, an algebra if x is a scheme uh, a is a quasi coherent sheaf of graded ox algebra and it satisfies dagger if and only if uh, the following conditions are true well first of all a is non negatively graded and uh, the degree zero part is just a structure shift and then we want that a1 is coherent it's of course quasi coherent but we want it coherent and a1 generates a as ox algebra so this is what uh, you need uh, to make a plot but what you do is you define a cone over x is a c over x where c is a spec a and a satisfies dagger now what you can ask yourself uh, you should view this as analogous to the definition uh, a vector bundle over x is e over x uh, where e is spec sim star e and e is locally free of finite rank So, in some sense, this is a nice definition, but in some sense, it also isn't, because, uh, for instance, for the vector bundle, we want to remember the structure. I mean, if I take just uh, x times a n, uh, the vector bundle structure is not just uh, determined by the scheme structure. So, how much do I need to put to remember not only the scheme, but also the algebra from which it comes from? So certainly I can recover, like here, I can recover A from C. A is just a pi push forward of OC. This is always true for any speck of a sheaf of algebra. But what I need uh, is the graded decomposition. So what I have to add here, together with a relative, a GM action. So where the GM action corresponds to the grading. So and by GM action, I mean the GM X on C in such a way that it commutes with the projection to X. And what you can verify, in particular in this case, you can recover the vector bundle structure. So you can view 
a cone as a generalization of a vector bundle. And uh, in fact, there is one more notion, which is an abelian cone is a cone back A such that the natural map from thin star of A1 to A, which is given by the product. This is always subjective by assumption, is an isomorphism. And uh, it is an easy exercise. And of course, I have to define you what uh, and uh, uh, if uh, C1 and C2 are cones over X, a morphism, a morphism of cones is a morphism as X schemes. which is GM equivariant. And it's a very easy exercise to verify, which I will not do, but, well, first of all, that uh, once I define morphism this way, uh, there is a natural equivalent categories. So here again we fix, uh, we keep the scheme X fixed. fixed. So A uh, chief of algebra satisfying dagger and of course the morphisms are morphisms, homomorphisms of sheets of graded OX algebra. And this is a uh, cone over x with the arrow givers. And uh, this inside here, this induces an equivalence between, well, first of all, I can go from uh, uh, rank locally three coherent sheets on X to uh, vector bundles on X of. So how do I, how is, does this induce this? Well, this one is just a full subcategory. And uh, here I have a natural functor which sends E to set. To uh, sorry, sim star e, and uh, similarly, I have with the same formula coherent sheets on X and abelian cones over X. So, in fact, in some sense, I, I think that it would be very nice if abelian cones have a better name. Because I think uh, that we, we have the word vector bundles, which comes from differential topology and differential geometry, and it's a certainly a very important concept, just like locally free coherent sheet is very important. But I think as seen from the naming, in algebraic geometry, coherent is perhaps the most fundamental object. And uh, abelian cones are really the geometric counterpart to uh, it. They are, let me give you an example. Uh, if uh, uh, Remember all our schemes uh, are schemes over a field. And then I on the one hand, I have uh, omega x over k which is coherent because I'm assuming that the scheme is of finite type and uh, it corresponds and what I would like to do is to view Tx as back 
and this in general is an abelian cone. So it's, uh, it, to me, this, I, I like to think of abelian cones as really singular vector bundles or maybe even, you know, families of vector spaces in algebraic geometry. They are a very natural concept. So how about the relationship between cones and abelian cones? And uh, here we have another natural, very natural thing. As I said, whenever A satisfies uh, is a graded algebra, there is a natural map like this. And uh, by uh, the assumption dagger, this map is surjective. Now, a uh, surjection of sheets of algebra corresponds to a closed embedding of, uh, uh, of schemes. And therefore, it's also very easy to prove lemma uh, the inclusion uh, abelian cones over x to cones over x, or inclusion, I mean uh, a fully faithful map of categories has an edge joint and uh, of course I could remember by heart uh, what, uh, we, whether it's a left or the right adjoint, but let me write down what properties it has. It has an adjoint which sends uh, C equals pack A to inside um, pack sim A1. Uh, which satisfies the following universal property that if uh, A is an abelian cone, let me call this A of C, the abelianized. If uh, A is an abelian cone, then the, the, the natural map from uh, the morphisms from A of C as cones to the morphisms from C to A is a bijection. Yes, let me give this another name. Or let me call it C1. So that I call C the cones and A the abelianization. I mean, I will not be using this. Uh, in general very much, but what I think is important is to understand that, that there is this correspondence and in particular that under uh, a morphism of, a bit of cones is completely determined in particular to every morphism of cones we can associate a morphism of their abelianization. Uh, it's not true the vice versa, but it means that you see, a morphism of abelian cones is just a morphism of coherent sheets. So if I want to do a morphism of arbitrary cones, I'm just taking some morphism among these coherent sheets. And uh, in particular, this tells us that we could give, if we wanted, a completely geometric definition of cone. I mean, abelian cones, are just uh, geometric counterparts of coherent sheets. And the uh, cones are things which can uh, close the subschemes inside an abelian cone, which are GM equivariant, which are, as I said, the structure of abelian cone, the structure of vector bundles, is determined by the scalar multiplication. You don't have to specify the sum. The sum is defined once the scalar multiplication is. And, uh, um, and uh, therefore, what you're doing is you are taking the only closed subschemes which uh, respect, uh, which uh, keep having the multiplication on. And uh, that's why, of course, they're called. Is there something that is said uh, about the So, the addition with fiber, both fiber, vector Yes. The vector fibers are vector spaces. Yes. 
That's why it's called the uh, abelian because uh, it's uh, the fi each fiber is not just a cone, but it's a cone which is a vector space and hence an abelian group. That's by the of the yes. So the the key point uh, is uh, that uh, uh, when uh, when you start uh, defining what is a vector space, uh, you insist that uh, you have the scalar multiplication and the sum. And then when you ask a physicist, uh, they will tell you that the sum is enough and the multiplication by scalars is induced because, uh, you know, they, they are physicists. And uh, uh, if uh, you work in algebraic geometry, it's the other way around. It's the multiplication by scalars that determines the sum. And of course, I mean, so in all this picture, I have a fixed a base scheme, but uh, clearly this changes just like vector bundles do, uh, cones pull back in an oh let me remind you there's another um, there is another construction uh, which I always forget uh, until uh, I I remember it the namely when uh, you have a coherent sheaf you can also make their direct sum which is also a coherent sheaf and this is very easy to describe uh, and extend to a property of schemes of cones. So, uh, remark if P1 and P2 are cones, uh, then so is their fiber product, which is the tensor product of the algebra. And uh, uh, of course, the other thing is that there is one assumption which I haven't used so far, which is that the degree zero part is OX. And uh, this implies that uh, each cone has a unique GM invariant. Section, which is given by uh, so F0 from F to C. It's normal. It's cool. If I have a cone defined as, uh, oh. as this, it, it has a unique, there's always a scalar, and this is just uh, given by A uh, map to OX by mapping all the all the positive uh, degrees into zero. So th there's, there's no choice here. Okay, so that, uh, so these are the properties. And uh, finally, there is uh, uh, the functor reality property, which is uh, that, uh, of course, if F from X, X zero is a morphism, then it induces Uh, pull back from cones over x to cones over x twiddle, which uh, preserves uh, being uh, which preserves being abelian and a vector bound. So this is just fiber product. Of course, it's defined by pulling back the sheaf of algebras. And uh, let me remind you that another way, in some sense, that I insist that to me the abelian cones are a very fundamental object, you could say that a, a vector bundle is uh, an abelian cone which is flat over the base scheme. Yes? Sorry? Okay, so the GM action means uh, what, let me write, what is a GM action like this over C? So this is, uh, so, uh, this is spec A of t, t minus 1, 
And uh, so this is uh, spec A. So this corresponds to giving a map the other way around. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the map is given by mapping uh, an A here. I can write it as uh, A0 plus, plus AN with AI in AI. And I map it to uh, A0 plus TA1 plus T squared A2 plus T to the N. AN. So this defines me if I have the A action, then uh, if I have the grading, it determines a group action. Notice that I don't have uh, terms of negative degree. So if I want, in fact, uh, I can, uh, one way to say, oh, and uh, conversely, I can recover the grading by saying that uh, AI is uh, the eigen. Uh, sheaf in A equal pi push forward of OC corresponding to the character T goes <laughs> into T to the I. So the grading determines the GM action and the GM action determines the grading. Let me notice that in fact here there is no no, neg no negative powers of T. So one thing which has come up in the literature is uh, that uh, you can uh, view this also as an action of uh, A1, viewed as a semigroup. A1 is not a group, but it's a semigroup with a multiplication. And all you are saying is that this map actually extends to this map uh, precisely because that there is no pole. So this, again, this is, uh, but I, it, it's not, it's something extremely elementary, but uh, in some of the references, it's uh, considered so elementary, it's not written down. And uh, uh, some people have found it confusing. So that's why I thought I would mention it. Yes? No, I, I didn't check. Uh, my problem is that I don't even know very well what a torsion-free shift is uh, on. Uh, um, ah, I think, I, well, look, let me uh, think about it. So to define torsion-free, you need some assumption on the base scheme, right? Yeah, so uh, let, let me put it away. Yes. So I think it's related to the components of, uh, the, uh, of the code. So you want, uh, it would be something like that every component of the cone dominates or has an image in X uh, with the correct dimension. So the typical thing that can happen, well, we'll see examples in a minute. Uh, maybe then it will be slightly clearer. OK. So And uh, the point, uh, so this is uh, kind of the general language about cones. And uh, there is one, so now the, the cone we are really interested in is uh, indeed uh, the normal cone. And uh, it's, so now we are back. Remember, we have our x inside m. We have its normal cone. And uh, we have its normal sheaf, which again, it's uh, not a very pretty name because we don't really view it as a sheaf. This is the name, but we view it as an abelian cone. This is just uh, the abelianization of the normal cone. So, and therefore, it comes with a natural closed embedding. And in this correspondence between coherent sheaves and abelian cones, uh, the normal sheaf x in m corresponds to the uh, ideal sheaf of x in m modulo. Or if you want, this is the ideal sheaf of x in m pulled back to x. 
And uh, the one thing which will play an important role in, in, th in the construction of intersection <coughs> theory is how does this uh, uh, normal cone change when I change the embedding? And it's not under arbitrary change, because of course you can get anything under arbitrary change. But what you want to do is you want to change M by a smooth morphism. So until now, the kind of morphisms that played a role in intersection theory were proper morphisms and flat morphisms. Uh, smooth morphisms never appeared. But uh, from now on, we'll see that smooth morphism will play a much bigger role. So uh, let me set put uh, the setup which we will need. And uh, we I'll do some computation, and I'll try to explain where this computation lead us to. So the first of all, what we want to do, <coughs> the typical thing you should imagine is uh, to think of x that's why I chose this name, as the object you are interested in. And M as something you embed it into to understand it better. So a typical thing you would think is that X is a quasi-projective scheme, or say projective scheme, just to fix ideas. And M is some projective space in which you embed it. Or an open, if it's quasi-projective, an open subset of some projective space. And of course, this will not be unique. So uh, one thing you can do, uh, if you compare embeddings, say, to something non-singular, is you want to compare two different embeddings into something non-singular. We'll see very soon why one wants to do that. And uh, the typical thing you can do is make the, fiber pro make the embedding in the product. So it turns out that what you are interested in, so question, assume that you have an embedding. This is a closed embedding, which we call I. And we have another closed embedding, which we call J. And we assume here we are given a because this is a row for some reason. This is a smooth morphism. So the typical thing you could imagine is that uh, this is a scheme which is embedded into some large projective space. And then you have found out that you can throw out a point and project it to a projective space which is one dimension less. And so this would be the projective space minus a point, and this would be the smaller projective space. And you want to compare, is there a relation between CXP and CXM? So as I said, any relation between, uh, so in some sense, what I like to think of is to think of a cone as an abelian cone plus some extra information, because the cone determines the abelian cone. So I want to view it. So the uh, other rel uh, uh, related question would be, is there a relation between the normal sheaves? Well, so now I call i, ix in m modulo ix in m squared. And J the same with P. And ask myself whether there is a relation between I. Uh, let me, sorry. This is just I mod I squared and J <coughs> mod J squared. So I call I and J the ideal sheaves of these closed embeddings. And I want to know whether, you see, these two are essentially the same as these two, as far as the information they carry. And the answer is actually yes. There is a very nice and very, at least uh, uh, on the shifts level, 
there is a very nice and very easy relation which is the fo sorry yes when I write a diagram I always assume it's commutes okay given but it's better that I write it a commutative diagram and here I'm assuming that I and J are closed embedding and rho is smooth and I don't have any properness condition or anything else on this, just that it's smooth. Uh, in principle, I would have assumed that this, uh, would want to assume that this is smooth of a fixed uh, relative dimension, but if I have a smooth morphism, uh, then it l the relative dimension is locally constant because the fibers have to be non singular. So if it isn't a fixed relative dimension, I can. Uh, the chop up P into connected components uh, where the dimension is constant, do connected components by connected components. So it's no deep. That's one of the advantage that while when you do uh, flat morphisms, you have to make sure at every step to remember whether you want this assumption for smooth morphism, it's uh, kind of, it, you, you get it for free. Okay, so the first, there is a, an easy, fact and uh, it's so easy that I never remember it uh, uh, um, uh, how it's written correctly so let me uh, copy it so I don't put my arrows wrong so first of all of course there is a natural map from uh, row pullback of OM to OP which is an isomorphism this is not very surprising and inside here, there is the row pullback of i. And inside here, there is j. And there is certainly a map here. Because uh, if I have a function on m which vanishes on x, then certainly when I uh, pull it back to p, it still vanishes on x. So that, uh, uh, so far, so good. So this induces. Uh, so this is a morphism on, in, so there is this coherent diagram in coherent sheaf over P. So it induces a morphism. I pull everything back to J. And uh, this is just i mod i squared and this is j mod j squared and uh, the theorem is you see since this is smooth what can i how what do i expect let me do the simplest possible case the simplest possible case is that p is just m times some affine space and uh, so if i just take the inverse image of x I get x times the same affine space, and then I will need uh, as many equations as the relative dimension to get back down to x. So this map will be injective. It's, uh, it was injective here, but it's not. So let me get this right. Yes. It's a J is the ideal sheaf of, uh, I, I, I had an indecision, and then in the end I decided I call J the ideal sheaf, and when I pull it back to X, I get J mod J squared. Because for any sheaf uh, F. So if this is something I do all the time. I identify coherent sheaves on X with coherent sheaves of P which are annihilated by the ideal of X. And the same here. So this uh, I will do all the time and without warning. So if you have doubts where a sheaf is, ask me. But uh, 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 the rule of thumb is that I will uh, uh, allow myself this imprecision. OK. And uh, so it turns out that this is injective. And the kernel is j pullback of omega 
um, p over m. And by the way, what is this map? Well, this map here, this comes uh, uh, from the usual exact sequence. So if you look at uh, this, uh, any two maps uh, uh, where this one is a closed embedding, not you have the, yeah, sorry. <laughs> OK, so the, where this one is uh, the usual map in the differentials. So, and uh, the point is, induces an exact sequence like this. And in particular, so what does it mean that I have an exact sequence here? Well, uh, certainly, oops, OK. So this means uh, that so I w this is the end of the lemma. And uh, idea of proof, I mean, as I say, again, this is uh, an algebra issue. So my usual way of thinking this is that uh, uh, if I pass to formal completions, uh, if I want to prove uh, the maps are there, so if I want to check exactness, I may as well pass to formal completions. And when I pass to formal completion, then I may as well assume I have a product with affine space. And then for a product, it's just a matter of sitting down and writing down the equation. So it's, it's very, really very, very easy. So idea of proof is uh, the morphisms are natural and exactness can be checked on formal completions, which basically means means taking the case where p is x times a m. Of course, if it's a product, then the sequence also splits. But on the other hand, what we know, and you see here it is, uh, what we know is that uh, this sequence anyway splits locally in the Zariski topology because this sheaf is locally free. So the x1 sheaf has to vanish. OK, so at least uh, we have found the relation between uh, the sheaves. So this tells me, now I pass, I have a relationship here. So now we want to go to a relationship here. And the relationship here is uh, that uh, there are natural morphisms corollary. There are natural morphisms from, uh, so remember I take spec sim and I change all the arrows. So I get uh, J pullback of T p of m. This is just the relative tangent bundle, the spec sim of the ohm. And then I have, this is uh, the normal sheaf of x in p. And this is the normal sheaf of x in m. This is something that if these were all manifolds, would be something that uh, you would know very well. And uh, well, I can also put a 0 here if I want, and a 0 here, which are just uh, the, the trivial cone, the cone spec sim of 0, the cone which is just x. But uh, the point is that since locally this splits, it means that <coughs> such that locally the risky, let me insist, so in case that it's not clear, the risky locally on x. Uh, the sequence splits <coughs> so i e there exists uh, a map from n x m to n x p a morphism of cones such that n x p is 
this map induces an isomorphism of an XM fiber product X. So it's a uh, in some sense what this tells us is that if we view in particular this means that this morphism is smooth. So this tells us that for instance if uh, we insist that uh, M and P be no M be non-singular if I fix X and I look at the shape of its normal cone for a closed embedding into a non-singular scheme then this the shape of it is unique up to adding a vector bundle in particular whether the normal cone is uh, singular non-singular reduced non reduced uh, this doesn't change when I multiply it with a vector bundle so it, it this is in some, to me the first evidence that uh, this cone really carries some information about x oh and uh, by the way you have all this thing here and uh, there is uh, a lemma which is the following so I have here let me call this star and the star induces a sequence 0 to j star tpm to cxp to cxm to 0 with the same again which locally splits and uh, again I will not what do I mean by induce well it is clear that since uh, morphisms between cones are uniquely determined by the associated morphism of abelian cones is that if this one compatible with this exists it is unique so all you have to check is that it exists and uh, what you have to check again is that uh, everything uh, that uh, when you take for instance uh, the inverse image of uh, this cone in here you get this basically this is all you have to check and uh, this again is something uh, you have to check an isomorphism of two closed sub scheme and again you can pass to formal completion you can work in the product case and in the product case nothing is happening everything is split so it's uh, I will not give uh, the proof you can find it in the book but morally it is actually a very simple thing and uh, so what we do is uh, we call such things things like this so exact sequences of codes and uh, so this is so definition an exact sequence of cones on a scheme x is uh, 0 to e to c to c1 where e is a vector bundle c and c1 are cones and uh, locally <coughs> Sariski locally on x in fact I, I think it doesn't matter where but uh, let me say the risky to be on the safe side there exists the splitting such that the induced map from uh, uh, it induces a, an isomorphism so notice that uh, there is not here it is a uh, even if you work uh, look at it in the context of uh, abelian cones it is not really like an exact sequence of coherent sheaves because you are insisting that the thing on the left be a bundle which corresponds to insisting that the thing on the right be a locally free sheaf so that is uh, so for uh, on abelian cones this is uh, exactly the same as an exact sequence where 
The one extreme, which is on the left, uh, if you look at it on the cone side and on the right on the shift side, is locally free. Okay, so that's a. Uh, uh, sorry? Yes, oh sorry, I uh, maybe. No, no, this is just a definition. Okay, so uh, let me uh, uh, try and uh, give uh, some uh, examples of, uh, especially examples of normal. So, as I said, the cones we will work with are normal cones. So, uh, I would like to view some examples, maybe leaving, uh, giving suggestion, but I think it's important. So, it is not necessary to understand the examples. Some people like examples, some don't. So, I think these are all doable. Uh, if you like to do examples, then uh, please try and do them. And if you, it doesn't work, just come and ask me. But I think it's better to first try oneself to get uh, familiarity. So, let me start uh, with a remark. We already did it uh, last time that uh, you should remember that uh, if uh, uh, m is a, is a d-dimensional variety, then the normal cone of x in m is a purely d-dimensional scheme because it is a Cartier divisor into this blow up and the blow up has, is again an irreducible d plus one dimensional variety. This we saw yesterday. So this is one thing one should always remember. And uh, let me list a few examples one may want to compute. So the first thing uh, we already said uh, is that uh, uh, if uh, that if uh, some some singularities uh, of course uh, the, the first remark is of course if x and m are non singular then we are always assuming here that x in m is a closed embedding if x and m are non singular then the normal cone is the normal sheaf is a bundle. Uh, but in fact, uh, this uh, we don't need so much. What we, if you go and check what you really need uh, to get uh, that the normal cone is a vector bundle, uh, you, uh, the nice condition is to have a regular embedding. More generally, This is true if x in m is a regular embedding. So regular embedding means that uh, locally near every point in x, the ideal sheaf of x, uh, so for any point in x, the ideal sheaf of x in m stock at x is generated by a regular sequence in omx. And of course you can read the definition of regular sequence. Basically it means that every step uh, you have a non-unit of course and non-zero divisor in the successive quotients. Or if you are into geometry, it just means that every equation really brings time dimension by one. Or if you really don't like algebra, think that it just means that everything works well. So this is a very key condition for intersection theory. And uh, however, it is also important. So for instance, this means that if you work with a hypersurface, uh, no matter how singular this is, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, no, the, with a Cartier divisor, however singular both X and M are, uh, you still get a nice line bundle and there's nothing wrong. The cone has singularities, but they come only from singularities of uh, uh, the cone itself. So let me give, uh, yes? Of the 
basis. Sorry? OK. Uh, let me uh, give some more example. Well, of course, one typical example you want to compute uh, is the fact that if you insist that the ambient is reduced irreducible, the cone, what the cone does for you is you start with an arbitrary scheme, which will in general have components of different dimension, and it puts things on top so that everything gets pure dimensional. So you take x being x, y, and x, z. And you can check that in this case, c, x, m is equal to n, x, m. And it has two irreducible components, both of dimension 3. You can uh, check what it is. So this is. Yes, I think that's maybe a better idea. And uh, th so what you have is that on the line, it's the normal bundle to the line away from the origin. And on the plane away from the origin is the normal bundle to the plane. And then you have to figure out. In fact, you, you can check that the dimension of the fiber over the origin is also 2, because it's the number of generators for the idea. Okay, so what if we want, so in this case you can say, well, it's uh, kind of pretty obvious that uh, I get uh, uh, two different components because there are clearly two components uh, into x. So it seems obvious that you can't have something subjecting on it. And uh, So let me do a slightly less obvious case. Let me start with m is equal to a2. And let me take ix is uh, y squared yx. So this is a line with a tiny infinitesimal point. Now, if we talk about irreducible components as topological space, this is, has only one irreducible component. But uh, uh, you can check that uh, the normal cone doesn't let, doesn't get fooled by this. And this uh, has two irreducible components. both of dimension 2. I mean, again, I won't write it again, but the dimension is always the same. So that, uh, in some sense, it knows that there is an embedded component at the origin, which may maybe it's. Uh, so now the next question is, what uh, uh, can, can I uh, see an actual cone? And uh, well, one way to get uh, an actual cone is to uh, start with a cone, so that is uh, also a, an easy exercise. So if you take uh, y in uh, Pn minus 1 a projective scheme and uh, m in An the cone over y, which means uh, I take the same equations, but I view them as uh, uh, affine equations. And I take x to be just the origin inside a n. Uh, well, then it turns out uh, that the cone over x in m is naturally isomorphic to m. And, uh, uh, in particular, uh, the, the abelian cone uh, is the smallest uh, vector subspace which contains m. Then nxm is uh, the, sorry? Yes, x is 0. Sorry, yes. OK, let me. Yes. It's, a ju it's just uh, in uh, Anyway, the point is I'm doing the cone inside M. Yes, sorry. Thank you very much. So and this uh, here will be 
the smallest uh, linear, uh, and uh, you know, actually, what is this? That's an interesting question or to work. I mean, it needn't be the whole of a yen. I mean, depends uh, how, uh, whether y sits into something smaller than the whole of a yen. Okay, so this is uh, a, a case where you, so the point is I want to make an example, so in particular, you don't expect in general that uh, this cone is equal uh, in particular uh, in general CXM may be different often I mean you just Anything. take uh, M which is non-degenerate uh, then it, uh, the normal cone will be the normal chief will be the whole of a yen and the normal cone will be smaller Okay, so what about, uh, uh, this is kind of an extreme example, can we have another example where uh, we get, uh, I mean, uh, where we get uh, something which is really a cone, which is not a billion, and which is not by us putting in a cone to begin with. And another example you can work out is the case, again, where M is a 2, and uh, the ideal of X is generated by x squared, y squared, and xy. So here you have three generators, which are a, b, and c. And uh, what you get, so you call uh, r the global regular functions on x. So this is uh, k of x, y. Le let me assume that I'm over the complex number in this case, so I don't have to worry about characteristic issues. And then I have that the normal cone is uh, uh, r of a, b, c modulo a, b minus c squared. So here you really get a cone again and uh, the normal sheaf you don't have the equation. And sorry this is spec and this is spec and uh, the condition is that a, b and c have degree 1. So this again is something you, you can check. So you, you really get uh, uh, things that get more complicated basically the more non-reduced uh, or with uh, strange behavior X is. In general, it's not very, so the, the normal cone has a, a use from a theoretical purpose. It's not very often that you actually do intersection theory by constructing an explicit normal cone. But it is, I think, nice to have uh, at least some intuition for it. Okay, and uh, now we come to an important observation. So the idea will be, so let me uh, try to give a preview of where we are going and set up the language for what we want to do. So what is the, the key idea of, uh, so let me give a definition. A morphism of schemes f from x to y um, <coughs> admits this definition actually, it's kind of implicit but uh, uh, let me just go, I'm not sure that it's a, a factorization. This is not precisely written like this in the book, although this is al always the kind of factorization he uses. Admit a factorization if uh, there exists a commutative diagram <coughs> I i with i a closed embedding and pi a smooth morphism. 
So notice that the yes. So a priori, I don't know that such a thing exists. It always exists. So let me make a few remarks. Uh, first of all, factorizations always exists if. Uh, uh, say x and y are quasi-projective. In fact, you, you need much less. And uh, it always exists locally on y. Well, even locally yeah, on y, and in particular, also locally on x. Uh, on, x. on x. Let me go. So yeah. the idea if it's so for you a morphism is always finite kind? Sorry? For you a morphism is always a finite kind? Yes. This was uh, uh, I said but I probably didn't write in the first uh, thing that uh, whenever I put write a scheme I assume it's finite type over a field and then whenever I write a morphism although I don't specify what the field is I assume that they're both finite type over the same field and then I get that the morphism among them has to be finite type. So this is, yeah, 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 morphisms uh, are uh, always finite type, also, yeah, 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 no, no, no. So this, this uh, always exists locally and so uh, factorizations, of course, if they exist, uh, they are not unique, but there is a nice way of uh, comparing them, which is So remark to uh, if f admits two factorizations, so I have x i a m a i a y uh, a is equal one and two, while they can always be compared, there is a third which dominates both in the following sense. In the sense that I have, there exists such a diagram I too. So and here it's enough that I take M to be the fiber product of M1 and M2. Since uh, these are smooth, then pi is also smooth. The, since I have this commutative diagram, I get a map from X to M. And then it's uh, essentially immediate to check that this one here is actually still a closed embedding. So if uh, what the, the idea is that uh, given factorizations, of course, that, that there's not uniqueness, but at least uh, it has a nice structure of directed system or whatever. I mean, it just means that given two, there's a nice way to compare them. And now we are finally in the position. Ah, yes. And uh, we give the following definition. Uh, since I have some space, I give it here. Definition: a morphism of schemes is uh, called LCI <coughs> if it has a factorization uh, such that I. is a regular embedding. And uh, what uh, is easy to see is that uh, this condition to have one factor, if you have one factorization where the closed embedding re is regular, then for any other factorization, the closed embedding is also regular. And again, you use this argument. Uh, the point is uh, 
again locally uh, so for uh, when you pass to formal completion this is just a product so whether it's a regular embedding here is the same as whether it's a regular embedding here because you can put first uh, the added uh, free coordinates and you get rid of them and then you're back in this case so it's a uh, it's really, if it has a factorization, and this is equivalent if for all factorization, i is a regular embedding. So notice that uh, it, this uh, condition, a priori, you could formulate without assuming that there is a global factorization. It also makes sense to say that a scheme, a morphism is uh, locally LCI, which is ridiculous because LCI already mean local complete intersection. But <laughs> if you want, uh, the a morphism would be locally LCI if uh, this condition is true locally in, in the sense that the local factorization exists. And we will come back to this topic. So in some sense, LCI means that it's a complete intersection in M locally in the smooth topology, if you want. So you can change and make a smooth chart. And uh, the reason is making smooth things doesn't really change the shape of the normal cone, except in the most obvious way by multiplying it with a vector bound. So the, uh, the key result in the formation theory, which uh, our aim uh, in the intersection theory, which uh, we will want to prove, uh, which uh, is the foundation of the Fulton McPherson intersection theory, is the following given f from x to y an LCI morphism of schemes. And uh, notice that here, uh, let me assume that it has, uh, yeah, again, an LCI morphism always has a, a relative dimension locally, because locally this is smooth, so locally it has a relative dimension, and this is regular embedding, and the regular embedding also has a relative co-dimension. Okay, so if I passing to a connected component, I can off relative dimension r. And this r is an integer, but it could be negative. So this is uh, r is the co-dimension of x in m min is uh, minus the co-dimension of x in m plus the rank of the tangent bundle. Why? Uh, then, and given a Cartesian diagram um, like this, so any morphism which is induced by this one, which means that. Uh, x is given by uh, regular equation followed by smooth. Now, when you fiber product a smooth morphism, you still get a smooth morphism. But when you fiber product a regular embedding, in ge a regular uh, closed embedding, you get a closed embedding, but it's in general no longer regular. So this will be a much more general morphism. We can associate to it. a map f upper shriek from a d of y twiddle to a d plus r of x twiddle. Mm, yes, that will be one viewpoint uh, if one wants. But in general, it might be that this one really doesn't, you don't know anything. It's just that there is a way to do this intersection, which uh, is compatible with uh, essentially anything else. So it's compatible with proper push forward, flat pull back, 
term classes which we haven't yet defined and we may or may not define and other uh, G upper chic. So if you can find a way to have uh, uh, something which comes from here and then something else which comes from here, you get a big square and again you can go one way or the other and you get the same result. So it's some huge universal property. And in particular, if it is smooth, if the morphism to begin with was just smooth, this is just uh, the smooth in particular. It's flat. It's just a flat fullback. So the idea is that this is called uh, a, a refined Giesin, and I don't know how to pronounce this, homomorphism. And in particular, a special case of this is that uh, if you just take the inclusion, if you have a smooth. Are you generalizing flat fullbacks? No, that is the problem. That uh, uh, Fulton says he has not found any nice class. Oh, and by the way, this is also functorial and everything. So if you have two LCI morphisms, then the composite is LCI. And the composite uh, is uh, the, the pull, the Giesing pullback is the composition of the Giesing pullbacks. But Fulton has not been able to find, a Fulton and McPherson have found a no uh, larger category of morphism which contains, uh, which contains LCI and uh, which is stable under composition such that you have a functorial pullback. So if you try to do the same and say, why can't I do LCI plus flat? Uh, apparently, you don't get something functorial. That's the problem. So you can define it, but uh, yes? I think the easiest example to think about is x is regular at y, y tilde is x. Uh -huh. And then x is regular at y. Take y tilde equal to x. And then x tilde is also equal to x. There is a problem there, right? It's the, uh, well, that, that is one you, yeah. So the point is you want is really, uh, the point is you want this very general thing that it extends to anything. So to any base change. And in fact, uh, what Fulton uh, and McPherson have done is uh, they have uh, made a formal version of this. And they have defined something called bivariant classes. Again, we will, this is something we will go back to. Uh, but next week, not this week. This is just uh, the, the, the hardcore, the, the foundation of intersection theory. So this is the, and uh, the first thing uh, which will be needed uh, for this, and I would like to at least uh, mention it, and with this, uh, uh, I think for today we will be done, is uh, that in particular, one thing which will be needed, so the idea will be that you take a factorization x to m to y, and then you have your y twiddle and m twiddle and x twiddle. So you have a cycle here. Well, you certainly know how to pull it back here because this is smooth. So here there is no problem. And uh, what, what can you say? Well, what you know is that uh, CXM is NXM is a vector bundle. In general, you know nothing of the kind about a normal cone of X tweedle in M tweedle. But there is a very easy lemma. And the left of the normal cone, whenever for any Cartesian diagram, x tweedle, m tweedle, x to m with i a closed embedding. So that we can at all talk about normal cones. Of course, if this is a closed embedding, this is also closed embedding. Uh, there is a natural uh, 
closed embedding C x tweedle let me call this map F C x tweedle of M tweedle let me write it here in F pullback of C x M. This is actually an incredibly easy lemma because uh, the point is that the ideal of x tweedle in M tweedle is the image of the ideal of x in M. So it's uh, this, this map gives you uh, a subjective map in, and uh, the same for the powers of the ideal. So you just get a set. We find this vector bundle on this Exactly. So the point is, uh, my degeneration argument uh, starts with, uh, uh, you, I get, have a class here. I get a class here by smooth pullback, which is a special case of flat pullback. I degenerate it to the normal cone which is something I haven't yet told you how to do, but I told you it can be done. It's uh, actually not terribly difficult. And then this is a closed embedding, so I can push it forward here. And now this is the pullback of a vector bundle, so it's a vector bundle, and I can intersect it back with a zero section. So this is the picture we have in mind. And uh, there is just one thing that I want to end, because Again, this is an important concept, and uh, we, will, we will have to go back to it. Uh, I will want to go back to it next week, but I want to at least uh, mention it, so those of you who are not familiar have time to look it up, which is the following. So let me start at the simplest level. So the, the, the obvious thing to do when I do this is that I will want to prove that the result does not depend on my choice of the factorization. Because, uh, you know, I have a factorization, but I don't know that, but it's not unique. So uh, what I want to do is I want to compare to such factorization. So as not to have too many indices, uh, let me assume so let me go back in the situation I was before. So assume we have a commutative diagram x i m i y and x j p rho m and I don't want to give this a name, uh, such that I and J are closed embeddings and uh, pi and rho are smooth. So this would be like uh, either the upper triangle here or the lower triangle. And I and J as before. And uh, then, then there is a natural uh, commutative diagram with exact rows in O x. And uh, so the point is, let me start with uh, looking at this. And here, this is a closed embedding, so I have one of these uh, standard exit sequences that are in the book of uh, Hartshorns, that uh, this is the I pullback of omega pi goes to omega x over y goes to 0. This is the typical exit sequence uh, of, uh, coten of the cotangent. And I don't know, uh, this is not injective, so if I call this map alpha, I can call this care alpha. So this is definitely exact, because uh, you know, I made it so. And then I have the same one here.
okay and uh, now I have this map here and this map here and of course uh, this this one here is just uh, again the standard map of cotangents and this we did before if you, as you recall and here I have of course the identity and uh, the point is that uh, it induces an isomorphism here and the reason why it induces an isomorphism is because of the exit sequences uh, here with excess rows and columns sorry here I have such a map and uh, it goes uh, to the relative cotangent of uh, so I might have no 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 sorry this is not uh, this is uh, pi but this is not uh, p this is p over y yes yes and then here I have a j pullback of omega rho and here there's a zero and here there is a j pullback of omega rho and here there's a zero so you what what you get what you know is so uh, these ones are exact basically by definition this one is just a very stat trivial fact about cotangents and uh, uh, cotangent bundle for smooth morphisms and this we did before and then you just change the diagram and you get an isomorphism here so what does it tell you let me focus notice it's all written very unreadably except uh, for this square in the center so what does this tell us it tells us that whenever I choose a factorization I can associate to it uh, this morphism of a coherent sheaf to a locally free sheaf on X and uh, if I have a compatible factorization I get a morphism between uh, this morphism so they get a commutative diagram and uh, this has the property that it induces an isomorphism on the kernel and an isomorphism on the co-kernel. So in other words, what you have defined is a quasi-isomorphism. If you, if you do this, view these morphisms as complexes where everything else is zero. So another way to say it is that corollary to, and this is something I with this is really the last say statement and it follows from this factorization is a corollary if f from x to y has a factorization then we can associate to it to each factorization a complex in co-x and uh, this is a very stupid complex it's uh, i mod i squared in i pullback omega m over y zero 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 this is in degree minus one and this is in degree zero this is a convention I mean you could put it in any degrees and uh, this depends of, on the factorization but which is uh, unique this complex is the complex itself uh, is depends on the factorization but uh, this defining a canonical object in the derived category of the coherent sheaves on X. So yeah, an isomorphism class. Okay, you are right. An isomorphism class. The point is it's a little bit more than that because given two of them there is a canonical isomorphism. So it, it, it's a unique up to canonical isomorphism. Let, let's let's uh, let's uh, if one wants to be precise. And uh, this class, I will want to call it L Tweedle of F. 
And the reason is uh, that uh, there, this is a special case of an incredibly much more general object, which is the cotangent complex. Which, so in particular, this exists even if uh, f does not have a factorization. And what you should view it as is uh, it's some kind, you view your, uh, when you have a rel a mor uh, two morphisms, you have a half exact sequence with the omegas, and you should view the cotangent complex as a resolution, just like cohomology is resolution of global sections. Uh, this is uh, also a resolution, it, uh, it's uh, like a derived functor, except uh, since it's derived with schemes, and schemes are not an abelian category, uh, it's much more complicated, and the technic definition is very, very old. I think uh, the definition of the cotangent complex is about as old as me, but uh, it, it, it is not uh, uh, attractive reading. It is very attractive if you like simplicial categories. Uh, otherwise, it can be a bit harsh. But uh, the point is, while the whole cotangent complex is complicated, this particular bit is really very, very elementary, and it's something you can work out with your hands. So I just want to point out that there is this object which plays a role. And let me make yet another remark about this, because now, if you assume it has a factorization, then it turns out that the morphism is LCI if and only if this LX triple is perfect in, um, well, let me not put an if and only if. Let me put an implication, because it's not quite precise. At least this one I know it's true. Is perfect in minus 1, 0. And uh, perfect uh, is a local property of a morphism of coherent sheaves. It means locally it can be written as a morphism of locally frees in the degrees indicated. Now, in our case, uh, since I am assuming it has a factorization, then I, I just am assuming that globally this is actually a morphism of locally frees. So, uh, perfect means in perfect, uh, the technical term is perfect of perfect amplitude contained in minus 1, 0. So I find that quite a mouthful, so I usually shorten it when I write. And this means that a priori the definition is that locally, the risky locally, I, I think it's a risky locally on X, you can write it as a morphism of locally free sheaves of finite rank concentrated in the degrees uh, which is uh, are non zero in the degrees indicated here in particular minus 1 and 0 in our case this is perfect because this is locally free so it's globally a morphism of locally frees so a way to view this result is uh, in some sense by the way f is smooth And this time, this is really equivalent to L triddle of x being perfect in 0, 0. So this means just uh, that uh, even only if uh, there is uh, no cohomology here, and the cohomology here is uh, locally free. So smoothness, so in some sense, if you view it like that, uh, LCI is like a little bit wider version of smoothness. Then, of course, your natural question would be, aha, maybe there are other interesting morphisms where uh, this complex is perfect but a bit longer. And then you are immediately, e at the first step, you are extremely unhappy because there is a theorem. Uh, of course, what you should look at is not uh, the cutoff. So what is L triddle of f is, is the cutoff at minus 1 of the actual cotangent complex, which I haven't uh, defined. But uh, uh, if you try to find the morphism, so this is f not or x over y. Uh, if you try to uh, find the morphisms uh, with a slightly longer perfection, you can't. So there is a big theorem by Avramov, and I can't remember ever the second author, that uh, if you have a morphism, either this, uh, L, uh, the cotangent complex is perfect in minus 1, 0, or it has infinitely many non-trivial cohomology groups. So you are done. However, 
recently in the last 10 years there have been ex there has been an expansion of something called the derived algebraic geometry there are several versions due to Luri due to Vezzo uh, Toen Vezzosi and others where you can working in a more general context have uh, perfect morphisms uh, with uh, things with larger perfections but this is still something which is pretty new so this stuff is really really old I insist the cotangent complex uh, is at uh, the end of the 60s it's a thesis of uh, Illusie and it's a nice two volume book in French and uh, but uh, this, the, to go beyond this, uh, you need uh, to enlarge the category which you are working. In fact, you leave categories behind and you work uh, with the closed model categories and uh, do boost field localizations uh, uh, morning and evening. And uh, uh, however, you do get more interesting stuff. OK, so that's it for today. And uh, tomorrow, I'll t tell you how to do the actual intersection.